Well, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for being with us here today. We pray that as we turn now to the ministry of your word, that you would speak by your spirit, Lord God. Thank you that each person who is here is precious and honored in your sight, valuable to you. And thank you, Lord, that you have a purpose and a plan for each and every one of us. We pray that your Holy Spirit, Lord, would speak to us today words of encouragement, words of release, words of liberty. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you did not bring with you your study outline that we've been in for the last three or four weeks, I've got some here, and I'll just uh, let you pass them back. We're not, uh, you're not required to do this, but Dwayne will be checking at the door. Make sure you filled in the blanks. And your entrance next week depends on it. No, that's not quite true. Hallelujah, hallelujah. <clears throat> Well, as we move in this morning, I feel like um, like I want to start with a joke, but I don't have one in mind. <laughs> oh, isn't that a crazy place to be? Uh, yeah, you're, Rose is saying, yeah, look at my life. No, no, that's not the joke, Rose. Um, uh, well... Okay, so there we have it. We will move right in. Maybe that's the Lord saying, don't try that. Um, Recently, we have been talking about inner health, the condition of our soul. So we're at the tail end of a series on practical Christianity. And the theme in this series is, if it's real, it should work. And so we've come to uh, talking then about the the emotional inner health. And a question that has sometimes been asked, maybe you've heard it before, but the question is, how is it with your soul? Now, as a culture, we we have a modification of that just as a form of greeting, and it's nothing almost more than a cliche. Well, how are you? Good to see you. How are you? It's even in Spanish. Como esta? How are you? And we, uh, it's just part of polite discourse. Well, I'm fine, thanks. Neither one of us meant that. Neither one of us meant, well, you know, I've got half an hour. Tell me all that's going on. Nor did the person say, well, I'm just doing fine. Well, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. But then if somebody were to say, thank you for being polite. Now, let me ask you this question. How is it with your soul? Now, they're probing a little more deeply there, aren't they? Um, if you've never met Jesus, and I trust that everyone here this morning has, but if you've never met Jesus, and that question, how is it with your soul, was to be asked of you, I'll tell you this, it is not well with your soul. St. Augustine of Hippo, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and I can't think of that without just thinking in my mind of a hippopotamus, but Hippo was a small town on the northern coast of Africa. And uh, perhaps Matthew can tell me what time frame, 600, no, 300? Early, around 300 AD. And uh, the church calls him Saint Augustine, but I'm gonna call you Saint John and you Saint Dovey. We're all saints, but Saint Augustine of Hippo wrote, and he lived, quite the profligate life. He was a womanizer. Uh, He liked to imbibe of the fruit of the grain field or the vine after it had changed its composition a little bit. And he he was, and he was incredibly brilliant. Um, Just, he was kind of an amazing man. And uh, somewhere he heard a sermon that changed his life. And he actually gave his life to Christ. Oh, yeah. And the woman that he had taken on as his Americanized live-in 
Uh, he said, yep, this isn't right. And they parted ways and he became a monk. Um, but he was still brilliant and a theologian and a philosopher. Um, he wrote these words. You've probably heard the quote before. Speaking of God, as it were a prayer. You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Until we trust Jesus to be our Savior, until we welcome him into our lives as our Lord, our hearts are restless, and we could say these three things about us. Number one, we are dead in our sins. Boy, now there's a word for you, isn't it? The culture around us thinks that they are liberated, that they are free, that they are pursuing their own self-defined rights, not God-given rights, self-defined rights. And the Bible says, hmm, about that. You're dead in your sins. The path that you are traveling down will lead to death. Dead in your sins unless we know Jesus. If we don't know the Lord, if our, Lord, if our heart has not find it, found its rest in him, we are searching for true meaning and true fulfillment in life. There is an inner search going on. That either A, we are very aware of and it's driving us nuts because we can't figure it out. Or B, we have self-medicated away that search so that we're dull to it, or C, we've given up and say, well, there really is no purpose or meaning in life, at least for my life, or by extension. Take this one, take this one. He was considered the smartest man who, of his time. He died about five, seven years ago. The, the, the man who was a quadriplegic in a wheelchair, he was an astrophysicist. He actually believed that when we die, we go poof. That's it. No afterlife. The consciousness doesn't live on. It's poof. So that's taking the fact that my life not only has a purpose, all of life has no purpose. We're just actors on a stage. If the heart has not found its rest in Christ, the heart is restless indeed. And thirdly, if we have not found our rest in Christ, we are estranged and separated from God, the God who made us and the God who loves us. And we long for a personal, a true, and a meaningful relationship with this God who somehow intuitively we recognize is my Father. So, in a word, if our soul has not found its rest in Christ, we are lost. And it is not well with our soul. So the primary message from this pulpit, for this church, for the church of Jesus Christ, the primary message is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That in Christ, our sins are forgiven. The barrier between us and God is removed. And that barrier is our sin, our guilt. It is removed. And we are, according to 2 Corinthians 5, reconciled to the God who made us in reconciled relationship with him. That is the primary message of any church that preaches Jesus or teaches the Bible. True soul health begins with receiving Jesus and trusting him to be, and I love this, we say our Savior and our Lord, yes. What does 1 Peter 2.25 say? For you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your soul. Hallelujah. Talk about soul health, soul care. It begins with Jesus. He is the shepherd of our soul. He is the guardian. And you know what that, you know what that Greek word is for guardian? Episkopos, which, oh, well, we have an Episcopal church. Yeah, we're getting there. The word we translate for Episcopos is bishop. He is the shepherd, that's the word for pastor, and the bishop of our soul. I should ask right now. Yes, if you're saved, if you're not saved, please don't let another minute while I'm preaching ask Jesus into your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, I open my heart. Come into my life. I trust you as my Savior. But if you've already done that, 
And you say, yeah, I, I, I'm sure that heaven's my home. I, I know my sins are forgiven. I know Jesus is my savior. Great. Are you allowing him to shepherd your soul? That's an ongoing relationship. I grew up on a beef farm, not the chicken farm, not the swine farm, not the sheep farm, but they were all near where I grew up, up at the University of Idaho. You've seen, perhaps, yeah, not very much anymore. I remember seeing them up around Sun Va uh, uh, Stanley, over at Pocatello on hillsides, but a, a flock of, shep of sheep. And you know that somewhere around there is a shepherd. Now, that shepherd is not just involved with the sheep the first day they're put out to pasture. Because if that's the case, those sheep are in deep trouble. Or I guess not deep, it's deep trouble. A shepherd has to be with the sheep all the time to watch them, care for them, protect them. Jesus is the shepherd of our soul. He's not only our savior, he is that, hallelujah. But he is an ongoing, day by day, I will walk with you, I will correct you, I will encourage you, I will carry you. He is the shepherd of our soul. You say, oh, but my soul, my soul is in, in great distress. Let Jesus shepherd you. Don't try and shepherd yourself. It won't work. It doesn't work very well. So, soul health begins with receiving Jesus and trusting him to be the shepherd and guardian of our soul. But for those of us, as I say, who have trusted in Jesus, we can still have soul problems. Acute problems or ongoing problems or, or both. In fact, we have a thousand ways we can get pretty messed up. Let's talk about the acute problems first. This would have to do with a situation we're coming into in life that is very stressful, is very discouraging, is, it has potential of great harm, and it really unsettles us. And you may say, well, you're not a very strong Christian if you allow those things to happen in your life. And I'm going to hit the mm button. No. And I would refer us to Matthew chapter 26, 38, where we read about Jesus on the night he was about to be betrayed. And they had gotten to the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus chose the three men to stay close to him, not right next to him, but closer than the others, and to pray with him. And Jesus said, my soul, Greek word, suke, means soul. My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keeping watching with me. Keep watching with me. Jesus himself facing this trial in an acute sense said, my soul is deeply distressed. Did he lose his salvation? Well, of course not. He's the Savior. Did he stop being the Son of God? Of course not. But in his humanity, he was troubled. Now, this is kind of a, a sub-sermon, but I, just as I was thinking through this, I thought, whoa, what a great model, because here are five things that we see as Jesus faced that acute distress of soul. The first thing is he was honest about it, wasn't he? He just right there, he said... This is where I'm at right now. Number two, he asked for support from the people who were closest to him. Good thing he had cultivated those relationships, wasn't it? Hmm, there a lesson there. Should we be cultivating relationships with people who are close to us? Yeah. And that's who he turned to, number two. Number three, nevertheless, though he turned to those people, he did not depend on them. He went further from them, and he had some alone time with God, some um, earnest, alone with God prayer, where he was seeking God. Number four, in the process of that prayer, 
He submitted his will to the will of the Father. Could have prayed for God to remove the In fact, he did say, Lord, if, if it's possible, remove this cup from me. Send those angels. Let's find another way. Let's go for plan B. Those things were not in God's will. And he submitted his will to the will of the Father. And then the fifth thing, and this is really cool, and only Luke tells us about it. But an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Did you catch those five things? Number one, he was honest. Number two, he turned to for support people who were closest to him. Number three, he himself got alone with God. Number four, he submitted his will to God the Father. And number five, God himself sent an angel to strengthen him. Isn't that, isn't that powerful? So we can have, we can have dark nights of the soul. We can have times where we're deeply distressed. Jesus is our model. Follow his model. Secondly, there are times uh, we can be saved and it's not so much an acute uh, problem in the soul, but it's more of an ongoing. And I was trying to think of the medical term for something that's ongoing. Uh, what? Chronic. Chronic, that's it. Yes, thank you. I, yes, okay. So it can either be acute or chronic. Chronic is something that lasts a long, long time. And it begins to be involved in defining who we are, how we think of ourselves. Honestly, it does. Now, in, in these situations... Um, there are ongoing uh, effects in our personality, our outlook on life. And here I think we could ask this question, go to our, our theme for this little segment in our series, Third John uh, chapter, verse two, <laughs> chapter, verse two, where Paul says, um, I pray that in all respects you may, be in, you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers, psuche, as your soul prospers. So when we're dealing with a, a chronic soul issue, our soul is not prospering. It's not thriving. We're maintaining, yes, but we're being limited as to who God made us to be and what his purpose for us is. And so here we find things like soul wounding. Oh, that's a soul wound. That just means somebody who was supposed to, by God's design, give us love, and they didn't. They gave us grief or pain or abuse or abandonment or conditional love. I'll love you if. That creates a soul wound, particularly in a human being of ages 2 through 12. Deep soul wounds there. We also could be talking here about someone who... Um, went through a traumatic, acute traumatic experience, perhaps a woman who was raped. But that left just an imprint on her soul. There was a deep soul wound there, and she's carrying that with her through life. It can, here we can, we're talking about things like addictions. Can saved people have addictions? I think they can. They are saved. They have trusted Jesus as their savior. But there is still a, a, a stronghold on their life. We're talking here about mindsets that can hold us back, where we, we believe something less than the truth. For example, yeah, I'm, I don't really fit in. I'm, I'm a misfit. I, 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 I don't have what everybody else has. And we begin to believe that. So these are ways that chronically our soul is not thriving. It's not flourishing. It's important to remember that, again, the first message we have is the gospel of Jesus Christ. But flowing out of that message is this truth. Jesus came to set captives free. He came to heal the brokenhearted and to bind up like you would bind up with a bandage or a, a band to bind up those who are wounded. So the ministry of healing is both for our body and also for our soul. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to give you seven verses 
that have to do with the Lord's ministry to our soul. And um, this is not on your outline, but if you've got a bulletin, give you a good reason to pick one up when you walk in the door. On the back side of your bulletin, there's a little empty space, and you can make some notes there. Seven verses that I think are worthy of memorization, worthy of meditation. The first one I've already mentioned to you, and that is 1 Peter 2, 25. It says, but you are straying. Straying means, oh, I think I'll go over here. No, I think I'll go over here. And you get off, off track. You are straying, but you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your soul. That's 1 Peter 2, 25. Here's the next one. Psalm 25, 1. We could sing it together. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Isn't it great that somebody put that to music? Because music helps us memorize things. That's, thank you, God. That's a good thing. Unto thee, O Lord, unto you, I lift up my soul. Question, who are you lifting your soul up to? Should be to him. Sometimes we lift up our soul to TV or to the opinions of others or to a substance. Can you, can, can you believe how, our, how many kids and teenagers die from fentanyl? I mean, it's not crazy. Wait, wait, where do we live? Why? It's, these things are just crazy. We can't lift our soul up to peer pressure, to the opinions of others, to the latest. Here, try this. This will make you really happy. We lift our soul up, our soul. What, what can a man give in place of his soul? We only have one soul. Unto you, O oh God, I lift up my soul. Yes. Let me not be afraid. Let me not be ashamed. So it's just it's such a powerful psalm, Psalm 25, 1. So think of it often. Lord, to you, I consciously lift up my soul. Amen. Amen. What do you think he's going to do? Oh, thank you. Boy, am I going to have fun with this. You're going to wish you never did that. God would never say that. God's going to say, I will take good care of your soul. And I will nourish it and I will cherish it. And I will see that it thrives. Hallelujah. Third verse. Psalm 23, 3. And we'll come back to this in a minute. But this is in, you should have memorized this in Sunday school. If you didn't go to Sunday school, it's not too late. You still have a Bible. Memorize it. 23rd Psalm. It's the shepherd song. The Lord is my shepherd. Let's say it together. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He, here we go, He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For Thou art with me, Thy rod and Thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup runneth over. What did I miss, Owen? No, go back to that. I did, I did. You, you anointed my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If you want soul medication, there it is, Psalm 23. Read through that. Meditate on that. He restores my soul. That means my soul can get depleted. My soul can get worn out, burned out, damaged, wounded. He restores my soul. And look in that, in the, in that psalm, all the things he gives us. He gives us protection, I shall not, uh, provision. I shall not want. He'll provide for us. 
Protection, his rod and his staff. They, they comfort me, they protect me. Guidance, he leads me in paths of righteousness. Peace, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. All the things our soul needs, Jesus, our shepherd, provides. Hallelujah. Number four, well, what is one of the primary ways God restores my soul? Psalm 19, verse 7. I better look this up just to make sure. Psalm 19, 7. The law, and when you read the word law, it's an Old Testament term that refers to the word of God, specifically, yes, to the commandments in the Pentateuch, but it extends to the word of God. So the, the law of the Lord, the word of God is perfect or blameless restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord, again, talking about God's word, is sure. You can, you can depend on it. It's not like, whoa, I might fall right off this ledge here. No, it's sure. Making wise the simple. Oh, I wish I had more wisdom. Get into the word. The precepts of the Lord, talking about the word of God. The precepts of the Lord are right. So much of what's going on in our world today isn't even right. I, <laughs> it's insanity. But the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Something in us rejoices when we read the word of God. It's like, yeah, that's, that's so true. That's so right. How does our soul get restored? Get into the word and get the word of God into you. And you'll find your soul being restored. Amen. Amen. The fifth verse, Psalm 107, verse 9. Psalm 107. Verse 9. And notice that many of these come out of the Psalms. I'll say, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Make friends with the Psalms. Let them become your best friend. Psalm 107, verse 9. For he has satisfied the thirsty soul, and the hungry soul he has filled with what is good. Let me just mention a couple names to you. Johnny Depp, Amber Heard. Did money satisfy their soul? Okay, I'm just asking. Did, did fame, popularity satisfy their soul? I don't think so. You see, O oh Lord, you have made us for yourself. And our soul is restless, and our soul is searching, and our soul is empty until it finds its rest, its fulfillment, its satisfaction in you. He has filled the hungry soul, satisfied the thirsty soul, and the hungry soul he has filled, not with something that'll just take up space and dull the pain for a little bit, he's filled it with that which is good. Hallelujah. Number six. Oh, I love this one. Psalm 138, verse eight. And you've probably heard me say this is one of my favorite psalms because it is. I like the last verse particularly, verse 8. But we're looking at verse 3. Psalm 138, verse 3. On the day I called, you answered me. You made me bold with strength in my soul. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He strengthens, he restores our soul, he strengthens our soul, and he makes us bold instead of being tentative. Well, I, I don't know, I don't know if I should do that. You've got to play it safe around here, and you never know if God's going to come through, or if people, friends will come through for you, or I don't know if I should talk about the Lord. No, we need, we need holy boldness. That was one of the things that, that resulted in a refilling of the disciples of the, with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 4. They were bold and they spoke the word of God with confidence. God makes us bold as he strengthens our soul. Hallelujah. Where, where, do you, where do you find this in the world? You don't. You find substitutes for it, which come from one of two places, the mind of man or the deception of the enemy. Either way, they're not... They're not going to do the trick. But here we find in the Lord, he strengthens our soul. He, 
He restores us. He makes us bold in him. Hallelujah. And then this one is one we may not often think of or turn to, but it's great. Turn to Psalm 131. And I'm going to read the whole psalm. It's only three verses. Psalm 131, verse 1. O Lord, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty. In other words, arrogant, proud. I'm above everybody else. Nor do I involve myself in great matters. That's that's an interesting verse, isn't it? You know, there's a whole lot of things that are sort of above our pay grade. I'll give you one. Gravity. Oh, Newton discovered that. Well, how do you discover something that's been around since creation? But anyway, scientists, as far as I might, and I'm just a layman, I'll I'll say that, but as far as Roy, am I right on this? Scientists don't really yet know how gravity works. Okay, thank you for, for confirming that. So that's just one example, but there's a lot of things that I could try and figure out. What was God doing before he created creation? I do not, it says right here, involve myself in great matters or in things too difficult for me. Surely, on the contrary, I have composed and quieted my soul. Like a weaned child rests against his mother, my soul is like a weaned child within me. And I, I, as I picture that, I think, well, wouldn't you, you should have written that differently. My soul is like a child on the breast that has, is full and is satiated. But apparently he's talking here about rather than being striving, it's just a matter of being close. Weaned and at peace and close. He says, that's what my soul is like. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forever. So there are times where we need to consciously quiet and compose our soul. And we do that by being close to the Lord and hoping in him. Hallelujah. So those are seven verses that I would just share with you about soul care and how the Lord uh, does care for our soul. Um, So we're going to take just about a minute. We're going to go back to Psalm 23. And I want you to meditate on Jesus being your shepherd. Now, I say meditate. Um... I just want you to think about that. You can close your eyes if you like. You don't have to close your eyes. And this is not guided imagery, if you will. It's not a practice in mindfulness. I reject those things. But it is meditating and focusing on the truth of the word of God. Okay? So I just want you to meditate on this truth. Jesus is your shepherd. Okay? Just think about that for just a few seconds. Now, secondly, you're still meditating on Jesus, focusing your thoughts, your attention on him. Now, lift up your soul to him. Basically, you're lifting yourself up. Lord, here here I am. (laughs) Here's all the stuff that's going on in my life. Here's the plate with everything piled on it. (sighs) Lord, I lift up my soul to you. Now, that your soul, you're placing your soul in his hands. And now let me simply read to you again these verses from that very psalm. O Lord, you are my shepherd. Because you're my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not lack. I shall not in desperation be saying, oh, I need, I need something. I shall not want. Thank you, Jesus, that you, unlike me, I run here and there and I try and do this and that. You make me lie down in green pastures. Here, come, sit a while, lie a while. 
These are green pastures. It's not a desert place. This is a place of, of, of life, of peace. You lead me, O Lord, beside quiet waters. You guide me in paths of righteousness. Lord, you're not, you're not letting me try and figure this out on my own, and maybe I'll go down the wrong path, and what if I make a mistake? Lord, you, you yourself will lead me in the path of your will, and it will be a path of righteousness. Hallelujah. And you'll do it, yes, for my good, but for your name's sake. You've put your name on me. I belong to you. So thank you, Lord, that you get glory by leading me into paths of righteousness. And Lord, even though and when I do walk through the valley of trial, the valley of shadows, the valley of death, because you're with me, I won't be afraid. I will fear no evil. Thank you, Lord. Your rod and your staff, which can both be for for rescue or for correction, and I need them both. They're a great comfort to me. And you prepare before me, right there in the presence of my enemies, those people who want me to fail, you prepare a banquet table for me. You pour your anointing oil on my head. You, you fill my cup. Here, here, let me, you want me to top that off for you? Here, I'll just keep pouring until it overflows. Lord, your goodness, your mercy will follow me, chase me down all the days of my life till I draw my last breath. And Lord, I make this an affirmation, but it's also a thing of great solace and comfort. I will dwell in the house of the Lord till I draw my last breath and then into eternity. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever because it's my real home. The house of the Lord is where I fit, where I belong, where my father is, where my true family is. Oh, God. Thank you. Thank you, shepherd. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, we still have about 15 minutes, 14 minutes. On your outline, we have gotten through the first four foundations for a biblical, healthy inner uh, self-image, emotional, mental, spiritual health. Oh, let me make this technical note here. Uh, take take a technical by, by uh, sidestep here for a second. The Bible presents you and me, us, both as tripartite beings and as bipartite. Okay, what does that mean? Tri means three. So I can give you scriptures that say we are body, soul, and spirit. Uh, one of those is in 1 Corinthians 5. There, we get close to it in 3 John 2. Uh, but body, you know, soul, and spirit. And sometimes it's helpful to think of us in that tripartite way to make a distinction between our soul and our spirit. But the Bible also presents to us uh, a, a, a recognition of us as bipartite. We are material and we are immaterial. Our spiritual nature, our, our inner nature, the part of us that leaves when we physically die. And we could get into a debate, well, which is correct. And some have developed theologies based on the tripartite. Well, our spirit is different from our soul, and that's how, and that, but we could also argue, well, but yeah, but there are other times where this mortal must put on immortality. There you have it, boom. I think that God did that for a reason. My response to that would be, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And I will not concern myself with things too lofty for me. I can't give you. There's a reason that soul sometimes is held in distinction to our spirit, and sometimes it is synonymous with our spirit. It's okay, because I would defy anyone here to give me 
verbs or actions related to the spirit that can't be defined by soul terms. I've, I've thought about that one. So if you can come up with them, great. Basically for us, to, so I'm, what I'm saying is it's helpful sometimes to think of us as body, soul, and spirit, and other times realize, but in our inside, we are, we are one person. We are our soul, okay? That's, that's all I'm saying there. So, um, for, for a healthy uh, soul, this is review. Number one, we need to realize we're created in the image of God. This is review. Number two, not only were we created in the image of God, we were created for purpose. So we have purpose. Number three, we must choose to base our identity on the promises, commandments, and statements of the word of God. We look at first, second Peter chapter one, uh, verses four, five, three, four, and five, right in, in there. Where it says, God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Well, how do we get those things? Through the true knowledge of him and by his precious and very great promises. So, God, we're made in God's image, we're created for purpose, we must choose to base our soul identity on the word of God, not on the word of the world, on the word of other people, our own thoughts on the word of God. Number four, each and every one of us needs relationship by virtue of who created us and the way we were created. We need friends. We need family. Jesus himself modeled that. This is not peripheral. This is essential. Koinonia, fellowship, part of the, the, the description of the first church. In fact, it's in the first verse of the description of the church in Acts uh, chapter 2, about verse 34, somewhere in there. So we all need friendships. We've talked about that. I'm tempted to do more than review, but we won't. We'll go on. We come today to number five. To look at how we uh, can develop and cultivate a biblical and honest, this is in your, your outline, an honest and a biblical evaluation of ourself. And there's one verse that I think really, really helps us. So let's turn to Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. Very hard to read that verse without also reading verses 1 and 2. And we should because they lead into verse 3. They set the context, the groundwork for verse 3. Verse 1, I beseech you by the mercies of God, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, I beseech you that you present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your, and the Greek word here refers to uh, worship, but not the hands praised and the trumpets and the, the uh, lyres and the L-Y-R-E-S uh, playing, but the, the form of worship where the priest would sacrifice the animal on the altar, that form of worship. And that's the Greek word that's used here. So presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice is our priestly form of worship unto God, okay? Then it leads into verse two. Um, and do not be conformed to this world. Dear Lord, God gave parents the responsibility to raise their children, not the state. Deuteronomy chapter six, it's right there. Fathers, teach your kids this in your comings and goings. Da, 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 da. Teach them the word of God. Teach them to love the Lord your God. Don't us ever abdicate or allow that to be taken from us. Do not be conformed to this world because that's what will happen. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove and approve of the will of God, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Perfect, teleos, complete. Doesn't need anything else added to it. It's come to full maturity. Isn't that the will of God we want in our life? We want his good will. We want his, his um, what have I missed it here? That was acceptable to him and to us. And that which is complete and perfect. We want 
his will in our life. Amen. Then that leads us to verse 3. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. So I want to point out five things here that go into a, an honest and a biblical self-evaluation, self-image. But first of all, notice that he says in, in the beginning of verse 3, I'm speaking to every one of you. So he's not just speaking to the pastors and the evangelists. He's speaking to each and every one of us. And then the first thing is this. He says, by the grace given to me, I say to you, well, is that just, well, this is what gives me the authority to talk to you, his grace? No, Paul is beginning by saying, anything I say is dependent upon the grace of God. Okay, well, how does that apply to me? Ephesians 4 and verse something, 7, says to each one of us, grace was giving according to, to the measure of Christ's gift. Each and every person here has been given grace from God. And he's the one who decided how much to give us according to the measure of his gift. Sometimes we think of grace as how we start our our Christian life. By grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, gift of God, lest no man should boast. By grace we're saved. But after that, thanks God for saving me. I'll take it from here or I'm required to take it from here. No, 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 no. Romans chapter 5, verse 2. By faith we have been given access into this grace in which we stand. Grace is how we are born again. Grace is how we live out our daily Christian life. We never outgrow the need for grace. By God's grace I'm standing here today teaching you the word of God. By God's grace you woke up this morning. By God's grace, you minister in the spirit as you lead us in worship. These things are all by God's grace. So yeah, Paul's saying, by the grace given to me, but let's realize grace is given to all of us. And here's my point. You and I cannot have an honest, biblical evaluation of ourself unless we start with grace. The world says start with yourself. Figure out who you are. We say, well, we'll get to that. Yeah, we'll, come, we'll get to that. But we begin with grace. Have I received his grace? Am I learning to operate in his grace? Well, okay, what does grace mean? You know, in G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense, that's great. There's actually two New Testament meanings for grace. One when we get what we don't deserve and have not earned, okay? What, what, we, what we have not earned and we don't deserve it, okay? That's salvation and just about everything God gives us. But a second New Testament meaning for grace is divine enabling. My grace is sufficient for you, God told Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. My grace is sufficient for you. 1 Corinthians 15, by his grace I am what I am. And his grace was working in me. And it didn't prove vain because I added to it everything I had. I gave it my all. But it was not me, but his grace working in me. Grace is the beginning point of my own self-concept. Otherwise, condemnation or performance will be the beginning point of my self-evaluation. That's, this, is, this is very, very important. God, thank you for your grace. Okay, now that we've established that, the next thing he says is, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Don't get all puffed up and think I'm all that. I've looked at people in life, you have too. It does seem that there are some who are given a whole lot more gifts than others. I remember sitting with a man who was my district supervisor at the time in Southern California. 
And he was speaking of Jack Hayford. And he said something like, uh, he was a, a seven-dimensioned man. I, I think it had to do with a reference to Leonardo da Vinci or something. But in other words, he, he was not only good, he was exceedingly proficient in many areas of life in the spirit, in teaching, in preaching, in music, in, in leadership. Yeah, there, there are some who are exceedingly, it just seems like they got a whole lot more gifts than the rest of us. Then we come to 1 Corinthians 4. Why do you boast as though you did not receive what you have? Because everything you have, you received it. It was given to you. You can't be boasting as though this is mine and I, I'm in charge. I'm the origination of this. No, no, no. Everything we have. John the Baptist said, man can receive nothing unless it's given him from above in John chapter 3. So, we start with grace and then as we move into the next point, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. It's because everything I have, whatever it is, is his grace. And if it's his grace and it came from him, guess what? I'm only a steward. And quite frankly, it's of some, okay, I can't believe I'm going to say it, it's of some benefit to be steward of less than more. Because <laughs> if you're a steward of more, you're responsible for more. If you're a steward of, so to whom much is given, much is required, Jesus said. Having said that, don't think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. And because of our prideful nature, that is something we can tend to do. And Paul says, don't do that. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. Don't become proud or arrogant. Think I'm all that. But here's the third point, And it's not in the text, but it comes by implication out of the second point. If we're not supposed to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, we shouldn't think more lowly of ourselves than we ought to think either. Why, why should we do that? Well, I'm nothing. I'm nobody. I'm not that important. Everybody else, no, 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 no. don't worry about me. Are we to defer to one another? Yeah. But are we to adopt some sort of mindset? Well, I'm, I'm not that important. That is, that's not healthy. We've already looked in Psalm 139. God made each of us the way he wanted to make us. And he don't make junk. So, first of all, we start with grace. Second of all, don't think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. Don't think more lowly than we ought to think. But here's number four. But think of yourself with sound judgment. Be honest. These are the gifts God has given me. Here's what I've done to develop the gifts God has given me. Here's what I need to do to develop the gifts God has given me. Be honest about those things. Now here, let me give you just some ways to do that. Number one, be honest. Number two, evaluate the feedback. What kind of feedback are you getting? Boy, I love the way you fix that. You, work, you can work on that car motor and you can make it hum like a kitten, purr like a kitten. Boy, I love the way you lead that small group. Yeah, you know, yeah, I appreciate your help in this area, but yeah, I'm not really sure that's your strongest suit. Evaluate the feedback. Now, be careful. Be careful here. We are never as great as our greatest cheerleaders think we are. We're never as lousy as our greatest critics think we are. Evaluate wisely the feedback. Number three, do I see fruit in what I'm doing? Do I see fruit? Do I see people being benefited? Do I see people being encouraged, pointed towards Jesus? Do I, do I see fruit? Number four, do I enjoy doing it? Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't involve work or preparation, like what I'm doing right now. I, I love this. 13 hours ago, 14 hours ago, didn't love it quite so much. I was sitting in there writing and thinking, oh man, I've got to have something good to say. There's preparation that goes into it. But if it's something God has given us, we will we'll love doing it. It's like we'll feel fulfilled doing it. 
And number five, do I, do I honestly in my heart believe this is something God has given me to do? Have a uh, sober-minded, evidence-based evaluation of ourself. Evidence-based. Is there, is there real data supporting what I think and wish and hope is true? Okay? Um, boy, there's so much more we could say. But number, where are we? At? Okay, so we've talked about... Um, Having an honest, oh yes, okay. Now, secular psychology could give us points two, three, and four. Don't think more highly of yourself. Don't think more lowly of yourself. Have an honest self-evaluation of yourself. But what secular psychology leaves out is the sandwich. The grace at the beginning and the faith at the end. When I evaluate myself, when I think about myself, Got to start with grace, but I also have to add faith. Faith that, well, I know God is in this. I know he's given this to me to do. I'm not sure I'm adequate. Uh, by the way, check mark, yeah, right, we're not adequate. But I have faith in God that he is going to work through me. And so with the grace and the faith, that centers our whole self-evaluation back on him as well as us. Work out our own salvation. Yeah, we have a part. But it is God who is at work in us, both to will and to work his good will. So God's at work too. It's an, it's an amazing partnership he's called us into. Faith. Faith is the currency we use with the unseen. I don't see it. It hasn't happened yet, but it's in my heart. I believe it's from God. Faith, how are you going to pay for that? With faith? I don't have, can't give you a credit card or money to to make it happen. I can't, but I have faith. Faith is the currency with which we deal with the unseen. So you may be sitting here today, well, this is kind of inspiring, kind of cool. But do you believe it yourself? Do you believe God has a purpose in your life and even yet at this point in your life can make something good out of your life? Get a hold of that with faith. I believe God. Not myself and not faith in my faith. Faith in God himself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wouldn't it be amazing if everyone here had a Romans 12 Three, evaluation of themselves. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't it be if we as a church had a Romans 12, 3 evaluation of ourselves? Oh, we would grow and we would grow. Okay. We are coming to the conclusion of this segment and this series. My intention for the final installment is to deal more specifically with healing of soul wounds. And um, I'm really looking forward to sharing that with you. But this morning we're going to put a pause right here, so let's pray. Father God, thank you that you have shown yourself to be the restorer of our soul, the strengthener of our soul. Jesus, you are the shepherd and the guardian of our soul. I pray for anyone here today, Lord. Maybe they've been touched at some point in the sermon. Maybe they tracked with me through the whole sermon. But Lord, it's, it's not the sermon per se. It's the truth of the word of God. Anointed by your spirit, I pray that you would speak life to people here today. And say to them, my child, my son, my daughter, I see your failed attempts at strengthening your own soul, at figuring out your life. I see your failed attempts. I also see the the pitfalls and the potholes and the things that have come against you in your life that were not of your doing, but they impacted you. But I say this to you. You're a child of mine. I love you. And I will do a good work in you if you put me first in your life. Trust me. 
And you say, well, I've heard this many times. I've tried it many times. No, 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 no. Today is the day I'm speaking to you. Put me first in your life. Lift up your soul to me. Watch and see what I can do. Thank you, Lord. I pray your blessing on each person here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Prayer tonight at 630. And we will be back on the Lord's Day in the Lord's house next Sunday.